Welcome to Geopolitics in Conflict Show. Today, you know, Russ, our viewers been asking for one of a specific guests by name. Yes. And we didn't. I we did not want to answer that by saying uh, yes. We're gonna have that guy. Well, today, that guest is right here, and our viewers gonna be in for a treat when it comes down to what our guest is gonna share with us, his perspective on technology, his understanding of where things are going. Would you introduce our guest, please? It's a pleasure to introduce Richard Turin. He's an award-winning executive with more than 20 years experience in finance and technology innovation. After a long career at IBM, both in Singapore and China, currently is an independent fintech and AI consultant helping clients navigate the uncharted waters associated with the latest cognitive technologies. He's also a speaker and author of many books, including his international best-selling book, Innovation Lab Excellence, and his new book, Cashless, China's Digital Currency Revolution. Richard resides with his wife in Shanghai and has for about 20 years. Richard, it's really a pleasure to have you on the show today. David and Ross, thank you so much for having me. It's a great honor to be here, and hello to everyone out there listening. Well, we are so excited to uh, get into this uh, uh, lively conversations with you. So, uh, well, we're going to just have a conversation, uh, Richard, here. Our viewers know our style. We, we don't focus just Q&A here, but rather a conversation, and we'll, and we'll, we'll take it from there and, and move on. What I'd, I'd like to start with, do you have something to say? Oh, I just wanted to say, ask the first, make the first comment. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, one, one of the first things we want to talk about, it has to do with, where do you see China moving forward technologically? And what are the implications for the U.S. Yes. regarding that? Sure. Um, real simple. This is, this is the easiest question. Ready? I'm going, to, I'm going to answer your question with the question. Where is China not moving forward technologically? <laughs> <laughs> and, that's, and that's sort of really the problem. Because um, you both cover the geopolitical issues between China and the U.S., GDP. But on a technological, technological battleground, China is no longer a copier. China is no longer borrowing ideas. It's innovating on its own right. So uh, as I say in my book, Cashless, people who think, oh, China just copies. Um, it's too far away. It's not relevant. China's technology is real, innovative, powerful, and a real challenge to the U.S., especially when it comes to things like the Internet, digital money, digital uh, sales, all of these um, pro products or things or services that can be done digitally are being digitized in China, and it's at a tremendous rate. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a big deal, and it's relevant for people in the West. It's not just that it's happening here, and well, it doesn't matter what happens in China, it's, it's irrelevant to us. No, it's deadly serious business. And it matters because we're entering a period where, now this is going to be controversial, I, I brace for it, where the U.S. will be actually copying China's technology. I think that's been predictable because China's moving ahead so rapidly and the United States is lagging behind as much as a decade in some of these areas. And, and yet the yeah. argument, the argument, uh, Richard, we're still hearing here is in the U.S. is that China is stealing the technology. You know, that's like, well, wait a minute, who who came up with 6G <laughs> already <laughs> yeah. launching into that? Look, there, look, uh, uh, it, you one cannot debate historically that um, China copied from the U.S. Historically, the U.S. copied from England, and that's not a means of, a way of, of, yeah. you know, of making light of it. But, yeah, sure. But that's sort of yesterday's battle. Yeah. And actually, it's very interesting because there was a survey by the American Chamber of Commerce about IP theft. 
And really, for CEOs of multinational American multi American companies here in China, IP theft was like number four or five on the list because actually, China tightened up its IP laws. Yeah. So it's harder now. So. I understand that that's still in everybody's mind. Oh, China steals stuff, and likely somewhere somebody can say that's still happening. I'm not going to argue that. Yeah, it's a problem. I know that we all do, but that is not the issue. When you look at China's AI development, when you look at their development of new digital currencies, you know these are all technologies that are made in technology in China and. Really don't have cognates in in the U.S. or in Europe. So yeah, there's a tremendous amount of innovation going on. Wow. Well, we can we can just see that one of us. That's well, one of the things we laugh about frequently is China is producing one million graduates a year in science and technology. How do you, how does any country in the world compete with that? Yeah. You know, I, I love that. I, I don't have the statistics like you do off the top of my head right now, but the Number of STEM, STEM, excuse me, graduates in China is astounding, yeah. and you know um, that unto itself is going to be very hard for the U.S. to compete with, especially when you look at. And now, I'm a graduate of an engineering program in the United States from a different era. Yeah, from 1987, from Princeton, right? I did my graduate work. Now. Even then, the graduate programs in engineering were, by and large, foreign graduates. But from everything I'm reading and everything I see, it's even more tilted in that direction today. So wow. if we're denying visas to Chinese students because of fears that they're spying, <laughs> <laughs> and we're not producing STEM graduates at either the graduate or the undergraduate level, you know, we have a real major problem to deal with. So yeah, um, China's push to space, China's push for AI, China's push to build chips, all of these demand that society produce science and technology graduates, and China is delivering with those. And we couldn't yeah. ramp like we couldn't ramp that up like we did when I was young with the space program, right? No. We, we, it would take it would take a decade to ramp that up right now if, if we even try. <laughs> Well, we look at it, for example, how fast now, when it comes down, just to piggyback on what you mentioned about space, uh, uh, when the U.S. Congress passed the legislation back in 2014 uh, asking that China would not have access to ISS, the International Space Station, China said, sure, we build our own. And they did. <laughs> and they did. Yeah, you see, and th 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 look, that's a wonderful example. And... Look right. Look at what's going on right now in the chip industry. So, under the Trump administration, we banned chip sales into China, mm -hmm. and I get it. There are certain chips that certainly that may have been prudent for, but there's an entire industry that was essentially cut off. China said, "Okay, we'll build our own chips," and they are investing countless billions to build chip plants. And wow. there's a lot of a snarkiness in the business, like, well, they haven't done it yet. No, they, you're right. They haven't done it yet. Give them five, five to seven years. The U.S. essentially pushed China to build its own chip industry and give it enough time and they'll be building chips. And what we will have created our own new competitor in the chip industry. <laughs> so, you know, for, you know, forgive me. And I, I don't mean to make light of it. No, no, no. Um, but, it, but, but, you know, assuming that China can't do is a really, really bad bet to make. With what they've done recently, how could you? How could anybody say that who's knowledgeable? These people are remarkable in what they're accomplishing. Yeah, uh, look, I, I live here and I see it every day, and you know. So let me let me speak of something that's domain to my book, cash list, because yeah. when I got here in 2010, there was no digital payment. And literally, I would take, when I had to make some really large payments, you know, uh, so rent security deposits to rent a new flat, I literally went to the bank with a backpack um. and filled the backpack full of 100 RMB notes. 100 RMBs is like uh, about $17, $15 or something yeah. like that, right? 
you know, so that's how I paid for rent security deposits, <laughs> um, rent. Eventually we did ATM transfers, mm -hmm. you know, but in the period of, of, the t of about three years between 2014 and 2017, Shanghai, a city of 27 million people, went cashless. You know, it was incomprehensible in the speed with which it happened. And it's, it's a really magnificent story of how China implemented technologies that were bits and pieces borrowed from all over the place. QR codes actually were invented in Japan, mm -hmm. you know, but nobody dreamed of using them to, to build a payment system. And that's what China's innovation was, using QR codes and, to build this, uh, this payment system. So um, living here, you see a speed of technological advancement that's frankly mind-blowing. And here's the thing that I think is important for a U.S. audience to understand. It's not about, say, the AI race. Who's got the fastest AI? It's sometimes about really dumb technology that's really simple, but China can implement the technology. Mm -hmm. China can say, oh, we can make this technology work, and they'll do it within six months or a year. The same technology is, you know, sitting in the United States. We have easy access to it, but we just are not able to implement and put the technology to work. And mm -hmm. it's not always about the... The, you know, the, the really complicated. Sometimes it's just really simple stuff. Mm. But this one has to do more. Like uh, Ross always said this one here. Remember we always say this has to do with the strategy. So oh, the, the it, plan and the strategy. Yeah. It looks like China is moving based on a strategy, on a plan. We don't. We are thinking of the next quarter, <laughs> politically speaking. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's really interesting that, you know, um, I... I pick on uh, GE's uh, chairman. Uh, his name escapes me now. The head of you know, the, Mr. Quarterly Man, <laughs> Mr. Qu Mr. <laughs> Quarterly Management, because you know he basically destroyed an R and D, a U.S. R and D wow. community, and made every corporate think in terms of very short term. And what you see here with the government is the government thinks in terms of five-year plans and even now 10-year plans that go out, out even further. Um, and uh, you also see corporate planning. You know, mm. look, at, look at Huawei today. Okay, yes. Huawei is a Chinese company that has obviously um, been crippled by U.S. restrictions. And whether they're good or bad, that's really, let's leave that for yeah, right. Obviously, I'm no fan of them, but let's leave that for another day. Right. Yeah. The point is, the company is now reinventing itself. Right? Yeah. It's going into digital finance. It's going into try self-driving cars. It's innovating its way out of a hole. Mm -hmm. And they yes, just came up, uh, uh, Richard. They just came up with the operating system uh, called Harmony. I yeah. believe that. So that just gives you an indication right there where they are moving with that technology moving forward as far as what, whatever they want to achieve for it. it abs absolutely. And that's, and that's the thing. And, you know, there are critics of Harmony who say, well, it's not so great. Okay, this generation is not too great. Next generation, tomorrow will be better. Will be better. And, you know, the funny, <laughs> and the funny thing is that what, what people don't really get about China is that they think about well, the next generation will be in a year or two. <laughs> China, <laughs> the next generation is in three or four months. Yeah. You know, this the cycle of change and the yeah. cycle for development of, of technology here has been shortened. You know, they they work in agile. In you know, you look at how they work. It's agile companies. Everything yeah. is everything has been the time cycle has been shortened to to a point where most in the West can't really conceive of it and that's what's hard you know so when i talk about china look when i when i got to china and they started with digital payment i worked in technology and i worked in money and banking for a very long time you know it was inconceivable to me that a city as big as shanghai would go cashless 
so quickly, even though I was living here and I saw that it was wow. a fast pace of life. So, you know, what's in, what's very hard for people from the West to, to sort of wrap their hands around is the speed of change. So people who say, well, I lived in China in 2010. I'm like, yeah, I was here then, you know, and <laughs> you haven't been back in a long time. It's different now. You wouldn't even recognize it. Yeah. Well, I guess it's the West or the U.S. in general terms. Uh, we are having a hard time accepting uh, this this change by which China has reached within such a short period. You're talking about like 30 or 40 years, and they achieved far greater uh, objectives than we, we anticipated, and we're having a hard time accepting that reality. Hey, look, a absolutely, and look, you're both better familiar with this on the geopolitical scene than I am. I'm more of a technology guy, which overlaps with geopolitics, and yeah. you're spe both specialists in this. And, you know, that's really... The question that is on everybody's mind here in China, will the U.S. accept a powerful China that is GDP powerful, that is powerful for technology? Is there room? Can the United States psychologically move itself even slightly off center stage and accept China as a global power and that's not you know that's not an issue at a university geopolitical level this is an issue for my mandarin teacher you know this is yeah. something that yeah. common people are very concerned about because they feel that china is being perpetually thwarted yeah. by the u.s Mm. And, you know, and they're saying, look, well, we do good stuff, too. And we just want to be recognized for the good that we do as well. And we want to be recognized that we're we're somebody we're not. You know, it's not 1976 all over again. It's mm. a different era and a different time. Yeah. The century of humiliation, uh, humiliation is over. <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. And that's and, you know, that's really a great line. Because it is absolutely in the minds of young Chinese today. When you talk to people, that sense of, like, look, we're not, this is not people in mouse, you know, in, in, yeah. in blue costumes and bicycles like a National Geographic article from 1976, just to yeah. use that year yeah. again. You know, and there is a sense that, hey, we are somebody now, and, you know, I think the concept is that people just want to be treated fairly and they feel that they're not getting that right now. And that works in the tech spectrum, mm -hmm. in the bigger geopolitical spectrum. Um, but keeping it with technology, um, you know, China tech is really good right now. And when you put bands on it, when you jail the, you know, <laughs> when you have the, the, the daughter of Huawei, you know, stuck in Canada right now, right. which is very much a political exercise. Uh, you know, I'm, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Chinese people are very concerned about the, all this going on. Well, the U.S. propaganda machine has all, has half the population here terrified of China, and they can't even say why they're afraid. But when I talk to relatively well-educated people, they're saying, "Yeah, well, you know, we need to be afraid of China. What for?" Yeah. Yeah, uh, um, it's very hard for me. Um, look, I've lived here for a, a long time now, and I love it very much. I was born and raised in the United States to an Italian immigrant family, so I have family in Italy, I have family in the U.S., and my home is here now. And nothing makes me sadder than to see the drone of um, really bad reporting and bad press about China. There simply is no story about China that is ever good. Everything right, yeah, about China right. has to be bad. So let's let's make that specific and into the area of technology where I specialize. Right now, China is undergoing a tremendous change in the laws that govern big tech. We're now, watching that. Right. Everybody in the world is watching it. And certainly I feel for all those investors, of which I am one, who has lost money on China tech stocks. Mm -hmm. I get it. It's, it's shocking to many. 
At the same time, in the West, in the U.S. and in Europe, we look at the same conflict. We have a conflict between big tech and the control that they have over society and government. And where is the right balance? Now, China which is interesting because it took a number of really big steps with about three or four specific laws that fundamentally change how big tech relates to society. Now, what's interesting about them is if you go to some deeper technology spots, you can occasionally find people saying, hey, look, these are some pretty good ideas and we could use a few of these. <laughs> you know, yeah. But if you really read the papers on this stuff, there's not a single one of these laws that has given any credit for controlling big tech in China. And by the way, if you think big tech has a, you know, a, a, an important role in U.S. society, right. China, which is digitally sophisticated in advance of, of the West in many ways, the, the role of big tech here is, is, is tremendous. So, you know, it's interesting because you can't find uh, uh, an article, except a very few, that say, look, they're doing something interesting, and maybe we can learn a little bit from what's going on in China. Um, but but it's very hard to find that, and mostly everything is greeted with, it's a disaster. China is a disaster. It's bad. And, you know, that's very hard to, um, to digest day in and day out. Yeah, well, that's become, uh, you know, the challenge also we're noticing that here in the U.S. with the big uh, uh, tech industries at you know, without naming names here, but we all know who the within the social media apparatus to the point that things will become okay. Uh, now they're gonna have to. <laughs> it's not they have to. They're already doing that by dictating to you what to say and not to say, and that becomes a little bit questionable as to where democracy is, and it kind of put the big question mark on where things are moving forward. So, absolutely, absolutely. That is the fundamental issue of our times, is what role should big tech have in society yeah, yeah. and what should be determined by government and what should be determined by big tech. Now, in China, look, that answer is easy, all right? There, there's no question of where that should be here, and that's good and bad. I understand that. Yeah. But that question for the West is absolutely critical. And what's interesting, and we saw this very clearly when... The Trump administration put a ban on TikTok. Right. It said, well, we are uncomfortable with user data leaving the country and the, the use of user data. That's fine. But what was interesting is the U.S. did not put any laws, recommendations, or any policies in effect which dealt with people's personal data, data and what you yeah. can and can't do with it. So yeah. it's one thing to ban TikTok and say, you, we're afraid of your data. Yeah. But it's another to say, look, here are personal data protection regulations that will help clarify what can and can't be done with data. And that's exactly what China did. And to a certain degree, that's what Europe did through the GDPR regulations. There. Yeah. So, you know, uh, it's like the double we're standard. We're avoiding this. The double standard, Richard. <laughs> That's what the West yeah, is well, approaching it uh, from that yeah, perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. I and mean, I, I look at it just with the. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you're aware of, or you were aware of the Prism program, uh, P R I S M, uh, Prism. You know, who gave the government the right to just read my text and listen to my calls without, even though for us in the West. You know, it says in the Constitution right there, the government shall not infringe on citizens' privacy without probable cause. And then becomes the question of, okay, is the government using technology to the benefit of society? Or is it using technology to counter the, 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 the rise of consciousness within the population? And this is where, as you said earlier, uh, the importance of technology... And why is that important in the West for, for us to understand where China is headed, technologically speaking? Look, I, I, look, I couldn't be in greater agreement with you. You use PRISM as an example. I'm going to use a different example from my book. 
And one of the um, critiques over a central bank digital currency mm -hmm. is that people will say, the government will know where your money is going. And I laugh and I outline very de in detail in the book, I say, the government already knows where your money is going. In fact, Ed Edward Snowden made a major point of saying how the government had cracked the Visa and the MasterCard networks, especially with regard to Europe and the Middle East, to trace money. So, you know, the concept of the government doesn't know where your money is going at this point is sort of ludicrous. Mm -hmm. but no one will exactly confess to it. You know, it's like right. you have to really read between the lines. So right now, the IRS has a really very, very large multi-hundred million dollar contract um, with the big data firm Palantir. And the contract between the IRS is to find tax cheats. <laughs> and it uses AI. So whereas the government says... We do not have access to your credit card data. We don't have access to your other personal data. They are, in essence, correct. They do not. But they hire Palantir. So, Palantir uh, goes out. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and it's because we have data brokers, data, you can buy every credit card swipe ever done in the United States, <laughs> you know, lifetime just about. And they have access to all this. Of course they do, you know. So it's this thing where um, it's like a cat and mouse game where yeah. we know the data is going out there, but nobody really wants to admit it unless, of course, you catch us or unless somebody leaks. And, you know, the reality is um, we have very few secrets these days. You're right, with the control of the government. Sir. But thanks to advances in technology, per se. So. Well, speaking of that uh, advances, uh, will it be fair... Wouldn't it be fair, Richard, to say that the 21st century belongs to China, technologically? Would that be a fair statement? Oh, absolutely. In, in your opinion, <laughs> you know, so. Look, I, you, know, I, you know, you see, the, the, here's the problem. I don't know. I do not have words strong enough. And I don't, and I hope, I genuinely hope that listeners, viewers who are doubting this or are unsure of this, do more research and follow this. Because, again, it goes down. Any, look, anybody who, I'm 60. In another two weeks, I'll be exactly 60, 60. So just numbers. So, Those are just numbers, Richard. <laughs> but I grew up, yeah, right. But I grew up doing this during the space program. Uh -huh. And I remember very clearly being pushed to become an engineer. I was always good at math, so it was a good fit for me. But I remember, be an engineer. We need more engineers. I remember what the U.S. with a purpose was like during that 60s Cold War conflict, right? And the only way I can describe China today to someone who would remember it is to say it's like the U.S. during the 60s. Mm -hmm. When you saw an advertisement in, on TV in 1965 telling you that this washing powder would make your clothes brighter or whiter, you believed it because science and te technology actually made it pretty much a fair bet that it was going to be better than last year's. Well, ever, China is living that right now. Next year is better than this year. Whatever technology you have will be better next month. And there is a government cultural mandate to do more, to be better, to develop technology, to use technology, and most of all, for people. You give somebody a new pen and say, this is a new digital pen. Half a billion people will buy it. Why? Because they believe that whatever is new will fundamentally be do more and be better for them and convey an advantage to them mm. in some meaningful manner. And people's uptake of new technology here is beyond belief. You don't get people saying, well, last year's technology is good enough. Oh, I'm happy. This is old, but it works. I'll do business. I'll deal with it. No way. People here want new. They want high tech because for them, high tech 
is a symbol of societal advancement and increase in economic standing. It's no. small wonder that such a high percentage of the Chinese people support the government. What is it, 82 percent? That's some outrageously high number. 99, look, you know, the poll gets criticized, but, you know, it was something like 94 percent. And that's, <laughs> you know, you know, look, folks, and I'm not, I know I'm not speaking to David and Ross directly, but if you're thinking that someday the Chinese people will rise up, and I see this comment all the time, I'm very active on LinkedIn, and probably once or twice a week I get somebody saying China will rise up and be free. Free from what? Let me tell you something. <laughs> China, Chinese people think they have freedom, and they do. And there is no desire to rise up. People love the government here. Yeah. You know, and it's really interesting. People don't get that the government is actually tremendously responsive. Look, let me tell you a story. I, mean, this is, I know I'm perhaps... No, 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 go ahead. No, no, you go ahead, Richard. You know, we have... You know, the, the, the party has community leaders and community representatives. And, you know, the amazing thing is we know who they are. They come by and they visit people. You know, they're like, hi, how are you? Are you happy? What do you need? <laughs> oh, my God. You know, really? I mean, I, I lived in Wayne, New Jersey for, you know, the better part of my life. Nobody ever came to our door and ever said, <laughs> what do you need? How can we help you? You know? <laughs> Not I, mean, I know this sounds outrageous, but it really is true. You know, China had a revolution. They get that. They know that being responsive, responsive to people's needs is critically important. So getting the streets fixed, getting small things in your community fixed in Shanghai, it's like they fix stuff overnight. It's mind-blowing. So wow. um, China's government is tremendously responsive to people's needs, um, and uh, you have to compliment them for that. That's true. You aren't kidding. Dallas City Council meeting. They invite the people to come in. And, so this really decrepit old lady comes in and says, well, in my neighborhood, the sidewalks are, are so rough that we can't do wheelchairs over them. We can't walk with canes. And the city council Classic. said, we're really sorry that's the case. Next. Wow. Yeah. And that's a true story. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. That's that's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. I don't know what to say. It makes it makes me sad. You know. I, that, I, I, look. I, I grew up in the U.S. I love. I love America, and um, it makes me tremendously sad to see this level of decline. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Um, that's all I can say. Exactly and, right. And yeah, Richard. When we address it, when we talk about those issues, we become the one that. Uh, uh, categorized or labeled as the mouthpiece for China or how much does China's paying you for that? I mean, such ridiculous comments to the point that you feel sorry for the level of ignorance that people do not acquire an understanding where things are headed. Well, well look, I, I get that. In fact, you can check my Amazon book reviews. And oh, no. I have, two, I have, oh. I have <laughs> like 75... Wonderful reviews, and then I have two of seventy-five, which gave me one star out of. And uh, so, so yeah, I have seventy-three five-star reviews and two that are one star. And the one-star reviews, both of them said that I was a I was paid by the Chinese government, who uh. was a Communist Party mouthpiece. And you know, my book is really I don't deal in politics at all. I just talk about technology and why the technology works. And then it's pretty hard to debate, you know, yeah, that it right. works. I mean, yeah. China's cashless. That's good. Okay, yeah. the, tech, the yeah. tech works. You know, but it's really, uh, that's a sort of a weekly uh, occurrence for me where I get that. And I, I get it. People are patriotic or people believe um, that America is a great place. It is. There's it no is. question about yeah. that. But that doesn't mean that other places can't be great. And that doesn't mean that we can't all learn from one another. And that's sort of the message that I get with cashless, trying to tell people that China's gone cashless. It's a good future to live into, and you will be living that future too. Maybe it'll take a while to get there, but it's coming and it's going to be good.
Yeah, cashless and Belt and Road. What do you think? Um, they were built to go with one another. Okay, Belt and Road, and is a phenomenal program. It's it's not perfect. If there there are reasons to have you know debate about the good and the bad of Belt and Road, but overall. China paid attention to developing countries because it, it was itself a developing country. And it saw that already 15, 10, 15 years ago that it couldn't go head to head with the United States in developing markets, but it did have technology and it did have infrastructure development that was relevant for developing countries. So they went to a space that the U.S. had long forgotten and ignored and um, done a lot of great infrastructure development that many countries could not have dreamed of achieving without China's help. And I, you have to give them credit for that. So now the next question that comes up is digital RMB or digital yuan in Belt and Road countries. And in my book, I talk all about how the first countries to use the digital yuan in, in cross-border trade, which would be removing dollar from, from uh, trade, mm -hmm. will be the Belt and Road countries. And it's going to have a huge impact on dollar use abroad. And um, eventually it will make the Chinese RMB or Chinese yuan into a significant global currency. Mm -hmm. um, you see it ever it's not replacing the dollar? No. You know, because and the reason, it, and it's a really simple, simplistic answer to that, is because so much is, so much of the Chinese um, economy is based on dollars, and based on U.S. bond holding, based on um, investments in dollars, that, you know, the two, what, what most people really don't want to admit is that the two countries are like Siamese twins, which conjoined at the hip. That's a good analogy. You know, you know, so, you know, this concept, you know, that we saw of decoupling was such nonsense. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't make antibiotics in the U.S. I'm not saying that there are right. certain critical industries that we shouldn't have. Sure. Yeah. But the concept that you're going to decouple from China when... I think the number was 27% of, of, of uh, imported goods or something like that were all coming from China. It was, it was remarkable. It was a remarkable figure. And, you know, somebody calculated, they said, look, even if, if we wanted to replace that, it would take us 20 years to build the factories. You know, it was, it was <laughs> yeah. just so, you know, impossible. So China and the U.S. are sort of Siamese or locked together, perhaps, like yin and yang in conflict, yeah. but they can't live without one another. And that's a key um, distinction for people to really understand. You just can't cut China out. It's not mm. going to happen. So, so would it, be, it would be even better if <laughs> some, some hawks in Washington will, will come to their senses and say, you know what, it might make perfect sense to sit down across from each other with the Chinese and talk and cooperate and figure out a way that we all can benefit rather than this, you know, pushing for a conflict with China. For what? Uh, look, uh, David and Ross, uh, I, I, I weep. Yeah. Look, no, we, had, so we. We, had the, we had this change of administration. We had the big meeting in Alaska. Oh, yes, and right. I was very hopeful and I was shocked at the outcome, and uh, and it's been sort of a downhill trend ever since. So uh, I I don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. Collaboration on coronavirus, collaboration for global warming, collaboration for developing countries. These are all things that we need to do. We are not just connected to China. We are connected to poverty. We are right. connected to people who are financially excluded from the system. And you say, well, that's just Africa. No, we have 23% of the American population that is financially excluded or financially um, uh, disadvantaged. Um, so, you know, it, it, 
these are real problems that with a little bit of collaboration between, the, between China and the U.S., between the U.S. and other countries, we can all globally do better. Yeah. But it's not you, happening. Would you talk a little bit about the people who don't have access to banking and how digital yeah. currency might make a real difference here? Yeah, look, let's, let's talk about this. And this is something that um, I give credit. I know perhaps she is a lightning rod for controversy, but Elizabeth Warren has been on this, and I give her tremendous credit mm -hmm. because her, her comments have been actually um, very, very good. So, look, the U.S. has a tremendous banking system if you look at it on paper. It has a great number of branches. It has lots of good statistics if you look at it. But then if you look at the flip side, the Federal Reserve itself admits that there is, I think the exact statistic is 22% of the population, um, which is uh, unbanked or underbanked. Hmm. That's the exact term. I, I missed it in my last comment. So let me just make it clear. There are 7% of the U.S. population that is unbanked. That means they have no banking services. And on top of that, there's 16% uh, of the population, which is called underbanked, meaning that they have to go to check cashers and pay for uh, payday loans and use oh, yeah. non-bank expensive <laughs> services. And this basically goes down the economic divide in the Americas. So basically, if you look at wealthy people, they have banking services. And if you look at poor people, they do not. Hmm. And what's interesting is the American banking system doesn't want the poor people and, and is not particularly friendly toward them. So now we're looking at central bank digital currency. Here's the thing that China is doing with it, is China has a massive unbanked population which has reduced substantially through the use of digital banking and digital payment. And now they're taking the next step, which is central bank digital currency, which means that you'll have a digital wallet on a phone or even on a little card. All right. It doesn't have to be a phone. It can be a very inexpensive little card. And it gives people access to digital money, which is the same as the dollar bill. Mm -hmm. And it gives them a way to save it. And it gives them a way to spend it. And it gives them a way to be included in the financial system and be relieved from cash. And what people don't recognize is that cash is a major source of robbery and theft and loss and financial disadvantage for people. So going digital gives people financial inclusion and gives them a potential way to save money and to get a leg up on the financial system, which has predominantly excluded them because they don't have enough money to be bothered with. And that's the sad, sad truth. Is that why you're saying now some countries, for example, pushing for, uh, like Bitcoin, uh, uh, as a legal tender, in, 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 in a way to start to uh, not rely too much on the dollar, uh, per se, moving into that direction, uh, with even the... Uh, the uh, what we call it, the central bank digital currency, CBDC, uh, sort of, you have countries that, like in Europe, I heard some conversations, and I have family lives in Europe, and, and we talk sometimes. There is now a conversation inside Europe. Some of them are calling to go back to the single currency. I mean, as far as each country using back its own currency. Yeah. There is a conversation going on right now. And to me, it was like, is this a red flag for what lies ahead regarding the application or implementation of technology into the financial system. Yeah, oh, yes. Okay, so let's talk about cryptocurrency first. Mm -hmm. First, let's make a distinction. Central bank digital currency is just that. It is a digital currency issued by the central bank. Mm -hmm. Cryptocurrency is a digital currency. It is, but mm -hmm. it is, in fact by a central bank. It's banked by faith of the users. All right? So, central bank digital currencies, which the European Central Bank is looking into, and obviously China's central bank is issuing, are built on the technology used for cryptocurrencies. Does that make uh, sense? So, yeah. so, so <laughs> here's what I say. I want to make something clear to everybody out there. If you hate cryptocurrency, 
absolutely your business. That's absolutely fine with that. If you hate it, hate it. But give them credit for inventing the technology that central banks are now adopting. And say thanks for that, even if you dislike crypto. Mm. Now, if you love cryptocurrency, chances are you're already proud of the, of the technology and you're probably upset that the central banks are using it. To them, I say, well, treat the central banks at least with, with care. At least they're trying, even though you may not like them. So cryptocurrency use in El Salvador, cryptocurrency use yeah. in Africa. Both of them have similar themes. Mm -hmm. And the theme is that these are countries that are underserved by the international banking population because of strict anti-money laundering and KYC, which is know your client regulations mm -hmm. that are really a fall off, fallout of 9-11, where the American and banking system closed down and said, we want to stop the flow of money to bad people. And in doing so, smaller countries were essentially cut off and cut out of the banking system. It made it very difficult and expensive to transfer money. It was already expensive, but they made it not just expensive, but really tough. So what you see with cryptocurrency is a lot of people who simply want to move money around the globe and there's no better way for them to do it. It's fast. It's, it's relatively inexpensive. Um, yes, there are certainly people who use it for black market and bad mm -hmm. purposes, and that's terrible. Mm -hmm. But by and large, most of it is run by people who just want to move money from point A to point B, and cryptocurrency is a simple and convenient way to do it. So, you know, it's hard to find, you know, it's hard to go to a developing country in Africa with a um, poor banking system and high expenses on cash movement and tell somebody they shouldn't use Bitcoin right. to move cash. Why? You know, I mean, you know, I, I get it. It's, you know, and there's other implications here because you don't want to, you don't want to destabilize an already weak government that may be really trying hard. Yeah. yeah. But at the same time, um, we have to recognize that banking services are not the same all over the globe. There's costs. And if cryptocurrency provides an inexpensive way for people to send money home, remittances, mm -hmm. right, which is what El Salvador is using Bitcoin for, remittance transfer. Um, God bless him. I, I, you know, I, I can't say no to it. I can't say it's a bad use case. But much of this is based on the issue that it's very hard for banks to transact in um, for, for larger transaction value. It's just hard for banks to move money around because of KYC and AML laws, um, which are very strict. Wow, that's an interesting concept. Uh, I want to talk about one, one thing that, that came to mind quickly while we have you here, Richard, because you wouldn't know more about this. Uh, one time I had a conversation with an individual who, under, without naming names here, understand a little bit about financial markets. Mm -hmm. And my argument to him was, hey, listen, and this is only, mainly for an American audience here. I said, look, it looks like to me, uh, and I'm no financial girl, I don't understand that much, I understand the basics. It looks to me that the more the government prints money, the more the weaker it makes the, the currency, the value of it. His argument was, no, 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 no. The U.S. dollar will always be on demand. As a matter of fact, it's going to go up. Is there any truth to that? No, that's a broken, that's a broken, look, printing, mon excess monetary printing is a real problem. It's, uh, it's the issue of our times. We're facing a major spending bill right now in Washington. And when I was working on a trading floor, I spent the first 18 years of my uh, career in investment banking. I worked designing specialty, mathematically driven products for fixed income and bonds. Mm. And what I was told from, the, from my earliest days on a trading floor was never bet against the dollar. It's a bad bet. You'll eventually lose. And that was just something that, you know, everybody knew. Don't bet against the dollar. It's over. That, you know, that advice that was sort of given to me as a young 
uh, 29, 30 year old starting <laughs> in, you know, starting in the business is is meaningless today. Yeah, and that's you know so people ask the fundamental question that you did is can the digital yuan replace the dollar? And then I say no, it can't replace it. But what it's going to do is it's going to displace the dollar in trade and in other specific uses. And the thing is, it's not because the yuan is so spectacular. The digital part is very convenient, cuts mm -hmm. fees, yeah. makes it fast, very good. But the but what really it's it's the dollar's game to lose. And the digital yuan happens to have the luck of timing in life, right? That's everything. And it's being printed at exactly the time, or being digitally printed at exactly the time when dollar overprinting is becoming a real issue that many governments are watching. Now, here you should talk to economists who know far more about this than me, but certainly it's in the newspaper every day about concern, international concern about how much dollar printing is going on. Yeah. Now, that's why I say the digital yuan is so lucky, because frankly, that concern will drive people to use a different asset. And if that asset is digital, is cheap, is fast, has other physical advantages that just make it nice to use, yeah. they'll flip. They'll go with that. Yeah. Well, that, yeah, that's why I kind of didn't buy that argument when uh, the individual is saying, no, 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 the dollar demand on the global market will always go up, but like to what degree when the currency is getting weaker? And I kind of like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'm sure I'm going to follow up on this with some other experts to see the other side of the argument. Look, he, look there's a point. Dollar demand is driven by not just the U.S., it's driven by the need for a currency to transact in, for international trade, yeah. for investment, for a lot of different reasons. And there's some truth to that. But that game doesn't last forever. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, right. you know, I talk about specifically in my book, I talk specifically about the use of the digital RMB in trade. If you're buying stuff from a developing country right now, you have to take your local currency, convert it to dollars, the dollar. then convert the mm -hmm. dollars, send them to China, then have them converted into RMB. The whole process for small business, small medium-sized enterprise it's not worth can it. take weeks. Yeah. It's not right? worth it. No. It's, you know, so, you know, you're making your payment, the guy gets it a couple of weeks later, he said, you underpaid me, or you <laughs> overpaid him because of the exchange rates. You're living in a world now where with the digital RMB, you'll be able to convert the money and pay, pay the guy for your container of new refrigerators within minutes. Yeah, wow. Who, you know, who's, who, who will not want to use that system? You're right. No, I, I, I do personally, personally, I do see it going that direction going forward. I mean, I do know uh, that, for example, uh, uh, between China and Iran regarding oil uh, transactions, they are conducted in the Chinese currency. Not all of it, not all of it, but some of it is conducted in the Chinese currency. So they're moving into that direction. Basically, what I see. Abso them. Absolutely, but I have a there's a but I, there's a side point to that. Yeah. The digital RMB will likely not be used for sanction busting, okay? Mm. In the in, in the in the early days, China wants as many people countries as possible to use the digital RMB. Yeah, and of course they're going to work with central banks. It doesn't just get tossed out there and say, "Okay, people use it." They go to each central bank and arrange use. Yeah, but. What, they're, what they don't want to do is to use it for sanction busting because they know the Americans will blackball the digital RMB and tell people not to use it. So, oh, okay. so I agree with you. So right now, trade with Iran 
is conducted in RMB, and it's also conducted in barter, and that happens. Yeah. And uh, I would not expect it to move to digital RMB in the near term. Someday it may, but not at least soon after launch, because there's too much at stake for uh, China. China uh, knows that its technology gets blocked, right? We have TikTok being blocked. We've got WeChat being blocked in the U.S. And when China launches the digital RMB, there were already two senators calling for a ban and a block. Oh, my they, God. Once, yeah, did you, know, were you, did you catch this? This is a great one. No, no. There were a couple of senators who said that American Olympians, when they go to the Bay... The, the Beijing Olympics in 2022, they should be prohibited from using the digital RMB or the digital yuan. Oh, <laughs> wow. It's already starting. That's crazy. So, yeah. So, so China's central bank digital currency is launching into this geopolitical theater where everything that China does is bad. Okay. And uh, the, uh, unfortunately... There's not much we can do for the digital yuan. When it launches, it will be perceived mm -hmm. in that way as well. And that's that's unfortunate. Wow, that's interesting. Well, I have one last question for me. I don't know about Russ, but I have one question for me uh, uh, that I'd like to get your intake uh, on it, uh, Richard. This one has to do with Taiwan. And why is that important? Not from a geopolitical aspect, but from technology. You and I know that Taiwan has the, uh, what is that company that manufactures chips? The TMC, uh, one of the, yes. top, the top companies, whatever. So, given the tensions that's going on, you know, of course, uh, between the U.S. and China over Taiwan, and now with the blockage of the uh, chip manufacturing, do you think that China is going to overcome that issue with Taiwan regarding the production of the chips in, in, in Taiwan. <laughs> okay. You know, so look, yeah, look, Taiwan is probably, is, is one of the world's largest chip producers and yeah. TSMC is the world's largest for sure. Exactly. So look, are they going to overcome? Very simple. China's going to build its own chip business. Look, this is new. My wife is from Taiwan. I love Taiwan. Hello, Taiwan. I, you know, I love you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, it, it's not like new. Everybody working for one of the big semiconductor companies in Taiwan, they were, all their top engineers and all their top production line people were being bought by the Chinese chip producers. So, mm -hmm. you know, they, they just said, okay, hi, we're a Chinese chip company located wherever in China. We'll triple your salary if you come to work for us. Oh, wow. Oh, 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 oh. so, oh, oh, it is. Oh, here it comes. I'm waiting to go about it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Who's gonna, so, look, they speak the same language, so there's no language difficulty. You know, you put, you put a job offer in front of a guy who, you know, pays the multiples of what they're making or some large enough amount, and, yeah, what you're going to do is you're going to buy away the brain power Slowly, and it's not going to it's not going to be overnight, uh, because I understand there's machines and other things yeah, that we yeah. have to be able to they have to be able to recreate. I get that, um, but um, yeah, they're going to they're going China will develop its own chip capacity. And here's the thing that most people don't get: they're going to make they're going to build that chip capacity using a lot of the brain power that they will import from Taiwan. Interesting. Wow, interesting concept. I did not know about it that way. Very, very interesting, Richard. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. You know, what's really funny is that it's the little details that you pick up in the Taiwan English language paper or in yeah. other... Here, here's my advice to everybody. Go do some Google searches and exclude all the major newspapers and go to the second and third tier newspapers from countries that you don't know <laughs> and read some of those stories because, you know, you really can learn what's going on. And, you know, and this just happens to be some story that I read about and followed up when I was reading the English language newspaper in Taiwan, you know, you know, having a coffee shop with my with my wife, and I'm yeah. like, wow, look at that. <laughs> so yeah, it's a it's a thing. Interesting, interesting. 
Well, uh, Ross, do you have any other questions for Richard? Richard, we can't thank you enough. This has been utterly fascinating, and the information is remarkably useful. Uh, so thank you so much for spending the time with us today. So Richard, if uh, if people wants to learn about you, where 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 can they go for our viewers? Okay. And... Hello everybody. My book on that side. I got to get the right side. On this side, our side here. Cashless. Yeah. Your left hand. Cashless is available on Amazon. It's available on Apple. It's available through the Barnes and Noble book, electronic bookstore. Mm -hmm. Go to go to whatever electronic bookstore you'll you'll probably find it there. Um, I'm available on LinkedIn. I write every day about China and technology on LinkedIn, and I write write really not just about hard tech. I write about some of the geopolitical aspects, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm also on Twitter. So Twitter and LinkedIn, if you want to find out what's going on about China and CBDs and CBDC and technology, yeah. um, the book is on Amazon and Apple. And I look forward, folks. I just love to hear from you. If you don't buy my book, I'm still loving you. And just, <laughs> just send, just send me a note and say, "Hey, that was fun," you know, and I enjoyed. And David and Ross, I want to thank you both. Your questions are on target, and they're really getting, you know, to this concept of conflict. You, you know, that's the title of the show, and what you, the questions that you asked, were really perfect for uncovering the real conflict between China and the United States. And I hope for nothing but less conflict between the two and that things re resolve. And I'm honored to be here. And thank you so much for asking great questions. Well, wow, we're circulating. We're circulating. I oh, enjoy having you here. And I'm sure our viewers will, will, will learn a lot from what Richard had to uh, share with, with all of us. So exactly thank right. you so much for your perspective. And to our viewers, you know, remember to subscribe. By the way, Ross, we are short about 69 million, uh, 469,000 uh, uh, subscribers because we have a goal, 70 million subscribers. So, so we want to thank our viewers. We thank you so much for your support and we look forward to having you next time. And as always, stay informed. Till next time. Bye-bye.